All right, next up we have, no matter how I look at it, it's you guys' fault, I'm not popular, volume 10, which, again, is, is a lot more of those, uh, it, it follows more of, you know, Tomoko and, and her constant issues with trying to have a, uh, like a social life. Uh, again, some of this, it, it's hard to remember. Uh, I, I did find this a particularly fun volume, especially because uh, it's about it's about here where they where there's kind of a break in introducing new characters, and it's more of kind of just letting everything breathe and sort of happen in the series. Um, again, I still really love this series, and, and I am glad that there's uh, talks of, you know, adapting more of the series into into anime, which, because, uh, you know, I love comedies, and I just don't think there's enough, like, good comedy out there. there it's just, it feels a lot of the same old, same old for me with a lot of comedies in terms of like you know it's it's always it it just doesn't feel like there's enough interesting new kind of takes and and tomoko at least because she's so it, you know a lot of it isn't misunderstandings which is an easy which it feels like that's a really easy thing to do with a lot of comedies is to always make it like some sort of weird awkward thing like there's the guy who's who likes the girl and he's trying to get them to like her back and the and the humor is that there's some kind of misunderstanding uh, that he means good. It's just circumstances here. It, here in these, Tomoko does exactly what she's meaning to do. It's just that she doesn't have the connection of how what she's doing and how she's seeing it is not how it's supposed to be done in a society kind of setting in a social setting and. The humor is how far she's willing to take her delusions to try and do something that she thinks not only that is a good idea, but will actually make her more popular for doing it. And, and then seeing how it all ends horribly for her. And, and also just how she complete, how she tries to keep applying her weird understanding of the world through her personal the, her personal lens and how that's constantly backfiring on her you know it would be easy for her to just ask someone for some advice especially because she has an older brother who she could ask for advice on like you know oh i want to do this you know with some friends you know you have some advice maybe and then you know go from there but she never asks anyone any advice about anything and I, I, I find that hilarious, that, that she's, you know, she's committed. She's committed to figuring this out on her own, and that it's nobody else, that it's everybody else's fault, and that she, and that, you know, she can't, she can't get around that. And, I, you know, obviously that's the whole point of the title. But, uh, yeah, I, I still love it. It's a shame, though, that, uh, you know, in the back, you know, you have the guys who, who are sort of, we're sort of impressed that they made it to 10 volumes because it's kind of a landmark uh, for them. But even still, they're, they're, as, they're almost pretty sure that uh, they'll make it to 20 volumes and that, you know, they might make it go a little bit longer. So, I mean, you know, again, with series ending and stuff, uh, you know, it, it's one of those series, like, if it ends, it ends. I, I you know, I can at least say that there's been no really bad volumes, and it's been very entertaining so far. Next up, we get uh, Berserk, Volume 38, which has been long overdue. At least a year, at least two years since the last volume of Berserk uh, came out and came out in the states. Uh, with them finally getting on the stupid island, they finally made it to the stupid island, and it, for barely like five minutes. For barely five minutes, they're on the island. The The large bulk of this volume is actually Rickert, a very minor character in the series, showing up in this sort of... in the sort of kingdom 
uh, land that uh, Griffith has created for him and all of his uh, subjects and subordinates. Uh, and and just seeing all that Griffith has accomplished, he's he's ascended to a messiah level, basically. He's he's like King Arthur and Jesus and Gandhi put together. And it it's it's so magnificent to look at and to see all the things that he's done, knowing all the things that he has done to get him there. Like knowing that there was this this other side to him that was, you know, in the first 12 volumes of the series, and then seeing where he is now from this sort of reform uh, after this sort of, this sort of you know, um, reinvention of himself that he went through. And just, it, you get the, you, it's sort of this interesting thing. Like, if, if somebody were to actually start reading Berserk from, like, volume 14 or 15... After the big, uh, the big dark eclipse, the God Hand eclipse thing, and and read from there with guts getting out of it, and and all the terrible crap he had to go through, and and all that, and then see Griffith as he is then, they would think he's the good guy, and and guts is the bad guy, and uh, or at the that he's gonna turn into the bad guy, which I I think maybe that's kind of where it's going with this series is that Guts is eventually going to have to embrace the darkest, most disturbing and and selfish desires to attain the power that he needs to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Griffith. And the whole time, everybody is against him because, no, because the things that Griffith did, the worst of the things that Griffith did, are the things he only did directly to Guts. He never did. A, he never did any kind of mass genocide or something. He never, you know, he never, he never like you know, uh, uh, kidnapped kids and and drowned puppies and and you know just just laid the world to a wasteland and then came back. He did like a handful of really terrible, awful things to like two or three people, and aside from him. Everybody else is more or less kind of forgotten about it or forgiven him about it. He's the one guy that Griffith messed with that is a hundred percent committed to getting his to getting what's owed to him, and I, I find that endlessly fascinating for for him as a character. That you know, it's not it's not this sort of righteous judgment. It's this incredibly personal vendetta that ruined Guts's life. And he can't let it go. He can't just move on. It's not good enough. He need, he demands satisfaction. You know, it's it's like Edmond Dante from uh, Count of Monte Cristo. You know, he could have just let everybody go, moved on with his life. He's rich. He's he's famous. He's he's got title hood. He's got everything he could want. Except those guy, those three men put him away in prison for twenty plus years, and took everything from him, and that's the only thing he'd been thinking about that whole time, Get, gathering together his plan and getting everything in place. And then even on top of that, the thought of is everybody else in Guts's team gonna be willing to go along with him on this plan? I mean. They they were willing to they they know guts they like guts as a person and they would be willing to you know do anything for him uh, you know Casca you know she clearly needs help and they're willing to go along with him to help her out but would they really be okay with helping guts enact his own personal revenge against Griffith having seen what Griffith has managed to accomplish and saying. Yeah, no. Let's go. You know, let's let's cut, let's go and and uh, you know string this guy up by his own petard and and uh, you know take him take him out back and and waste him. You know, would they really do that? You know, having seen everything they've seen and seeing what Griffith can do and how he's making the world a better place. You know, and never having directly witnessed the things that he did. You know, it. I really like that. You know, it's just a shame that Berserk only comes out like 
one volume every two or three years. It's, it's on Game of Thrones time. It gets done when it gets done, plus another five years. Uh, what are you going to do, right? All right, next up we have Toriko, volume 39, where we get some much-needed backstory about uh, the universe and everything. Basically, this whole volume is just a backstory for kind of the nitros and gourmet cells and how everything related to the ultimate full course meal uh, all came about and and Toriko's and Toriko facing off to to try and get one of the final main ingredients for the thing and and all of that it's you know I think it ends with like I think volume 41 and this is you know it's right on track for for that big fi that big finale and and also I just love you know Toriko and Komatsu they're like maybe one of the best the best bro pair you could have asked for in a shown in action series uh, still really cool inventive world and and I like how it's how it has a lot of the it it's managed to build this mythology around the idea of just food and it and you know the food is just such a big kind of topic for everyone and everything because of course without it we couldn't live that you know it feels like such a duh kind of thing to make as like your your whole world building aspect you know it, it's it's weirder with series like, I don't know, Yu-Gi-Oh, where everything is based around a children's card game. Or something like even Hikaru no Go, which, you know, everything is based around this one Go, the, the, this one board game called Go. And it just, it feels kind of forced. Like, obviously nobody in the world would be this obsessed with, with, a, with a game. One game. But in, in the world of Toriko, you do get the feeling that, yeah, everybody would be this obsessed with food because everybody wants food. I don't care who you are. You want food. Uh, some more than others. Some different kinds of food than others. But it's the one thing that everybody can get on board together with is, is we all love food and we all need it. And such a neat kind of storyline and idea that, they, that he... That he takes it to its fullest fullest limits with uh, as an idea. And again, speaking of food, we go right we roll right into uh, Food Wars Volume 18 and 19 here, with uh, Volume 18 being um, being uh, the judges uh, deciding that uh, that uh, Soma basically wins the uh, Shokugeki against the uh, against the main uh, principal guy. Uh, with his ultimate dish that he makes against him, uh, the dish being, you know, these delicious pot stickers with, uh, with, a uh, chick stuffed in with, uh, basically mushroom stuffed chicken wings, pot stickers, which, which are just absolutely delicious. The, the stuffed chicken wings, you know, of all the food, of all the food recipes that have shown up in food wars, this is the one that I really want more than any of the others. Uh, just, and, and also, again, I love the fact that all these are fairly easy to put together. They don't have too many weird exotic ingredients. You can make a lot of these at home. Uh, and then following that, basically, you know, the whole the whole uh, dormitory basically gets turned upside down uh, with, with the uh, inclusion of the new principle who's enacted basically a whole new kind of... Uh, a whole new kind of hierarchy system with the peoples. And then, uh, again, that leads directly from that into, uh, you know, volume 19 with uh, two of the guys, one of which is actually a, holds a seat on one of the councils, and, and Soma has actually challenged him. So this is the first chance for Soma to actually get on the, uh, I think it's the Council, the council of Nine. Basically, this is his chance to actually ascend to a meaningful position because... The only way to get on the Council of Nine is you have to you have to challenge somebody to a food war, and and of course nobody on the on the council would normally challenge someone, but of course Soma's basically managed to call his bluff and just lay everything on the line with uh, with doing it, and then also the the Shokugeki, you know, before that with two of the other characters uh, involving. A delicious salmon pot pie. Now I've heard of chicken pot pie, but for whatever reason, it never dawned on me until this volume 
that we could make a pot pie out of anything. And a salmon pot pie sounds amazing. Even the way it's described in here, it sounds amazing. It just, like I said, the, the recipes in here are, are almost worth the price of the price of reading. It's like it's like you're giving me, you're you're just you're just giving me more than I can handle here. Uh, you know, food wars, giving me too much. I can't I can't handle it. Then uh, let's see. Sorry. Next up, we have JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, uh, Volume Four of the hardcover, which uh, which goes seven through eight, which focuses mostly on uh, uh, the first half dealing with uh, Inyaba and her uh, justice stand, and then the other half dealing with uh, with a uh, with a uh, Steely Dan, who has been renamed here as uh, Dan of Steel, which, which is a uh, hilariously kind of stupid name for for him to uh, basically get around the whole copyright thing because uh, you know obviously Steely Dan is a is a trademarked uh, you know rock band name yeah Dan of Steel that's that's his official name in this volume now in in the normal digest versions he was actually called rubber soul now Obviously, some people out there, some of you other JoJo fans out there are going to say that, no, Rubber Soul was featured earlier in Volume uh, volume 3, uh, no, Volume 2, 2 or 3, where uh, where Jotaro fought against Rubber Soul, at, who had the Yellow Temperance Stand. And I would argue uh, that he never got a name, so... I would say the I would say it's it's up for grabs, you know who where, who you name or don't name Rubber Soul, uh, but that's just me. Um, they, like you know they they list that the orangutan uh, in part three is named is named Forever. I call bullcrap. It's an orangutan. It never had a name. It never was called anything. Unless I read that reread that volume and there's like some kind of label on the little on the little cage thing that that calls him Forever. I'm calling no on that. Same thing with uh, the Sun Stand, which is uh, featured, I believe, at the very end here. Uh, they, yeah, featured at the end here, where they where they knock the guy out, uh, figuring out how his stun Sun Stand works. You know, apparently he's called uh, Arabia Flats, and I would say no, he never had a name. They clearly state that they never that they were almost kind of surprised at how easy he was to take down. And that they and that they never even knew his name. In fact, Joseph even flat out says, "That's all the sun stand can do. It's really over. We don't even know his name." Like they even joke about how quickly he was defeated, and that they don't even know his name. So it kind of ruins a joke uh, by giving him a name in the series and again. May again. It's just me fanboying and and being super nitpicky about something, but uh, you know they. I know he's technically called Steely Dan, but you know I'll, you know I'll since since I didn't read the scans or whatever's before then my my introduction was in the English version, the English adaptation of it, where he was called Rubber Soul, and I don't know it it sounded it sounded kind of. I don't know. It sounded okay to me. Uh, you could argue, I guess, the old temperance stand is sort of a rubbery kind of blob thing, so it works better. Is that? But I'm like, whatever. Uh, Steely Dan. How does Steely Dan work better for for a stand that lets you control people with a little bug inside their brain? How does that? How do you? How do you uh, validate that? But uh, needless to say, uh, still really great volume. I uh, like the like all the color pages they throw in here. Uh, for some of the characters, uh, really nice, uh, neat little, little, uh, little stuff in there that you didn't get with the other volumes. And then also the really nice thing, you know, at the end where, uh, you know, he, where, you know, he talks, Araki talks about Enyaba. Um, it's, it's impossible to discuss the horror that is Enyaba without, Enyaba without the context of horror films, where he basically describes Enyaba as like, that old witch character that you see in a lot of these classic horror movies and horror stories and stuff, how she's kind of the 
Like she's technically, you know, behind everything, and she's also the most the most dangerous one. Uh, and you know, I definitely get that. I, you know, I like I like Danyaba. She had a pretty neat kind of story arc to herself. You know, uh, first being kind of Dio's right hand right hand right hand person, and then sort of going after the Joe Star, the the Joe Star and the Stardust Crusader people. You know, personally because. She really hated the hated the heck out of him for for killing uh, Jay Guile, who again is called Centerfold in here, because I don't know. I guess something happened with the rights between that edition and this edition. Uh, but needless to say, still really a uh, really great volume. All right next up, we have uh, Ravenna the Witch. Now I'm saying that because the title ends in a question mark, so technically the way the title is said is. Ra Ravenna the Witch, and uh, again, this is a Junko Mizuno uh, manga, which, uh, you know, I've got a lot of her other stuff. She draws this, she draws a lot of these, a lot of these designs that are very cutesy, but also very disturbing, sort of in this weird kind of, kind of uh, idea, and uh, the only, the only major complaint I have about this is that it's done in a storybook style, which is that, uh, there are no word balloons or traditional panels. Everything is done in this sort of descriptive manner where it's written kind of storybook style. And it's about a girl who is accused of being a witch and and then uh, you know, she she finds a different witch who is willing to like, you know, grant her powers to use magic and stuff and and uh, she kind of becomes corrupted by it a little and then manages to sort of come back around again uh, to get to get sort of revenge on those other people. Uh, it's it's a very neat kind of story and again if you if you love Junko Mizuno's uh, art style and everything uh, you know you'd you'd get a big kick out of it. Uh, definitely not for kids. I would say yeah there's there's some weird kind of nudity in here but again I don't think it's like super graphic nudity but there's a couple of naked women in there and uh, and also there's some rather disturbing stuff in there that you know ki obviously little kids would not really be into uh, which I, you know I don't know because it's all with a few changes it could be kid appropriate and I don't know, I'm always an advocate for trying to, you know, get more stuff out there that kids might enjoy, especially in comics, because, because, you know, I, I just, I just have a strong, you know, opinion about finding stuff that adults can enjoy that uh, kids can also like too, as far as comics, because I just don't think there's enough kid friendly, you know, really engaging and good kind of comics out there. For for a younger audience that you know we kind of that Marvel and DC have pretty much kind of abandoned trying to target kids like they used to I feel and the and that you know I'm always interested and excited when I can find something that I could say you know a kid might like that uh, but I guess you know Junko Mizuno is not the person to try and look for that kind of material from. But needless to say, if you if you've been a big fan of her stuff, you know this is again right up that alley. A great, great hardcover presentation and stuff. Um, you know, Titan Comics they they've done a lot of like Europe European comic stuff, um, which is odd because Last Gasp did some did a like pretty much the rest of her stuff minus a few that Viz got a hold of. So it's kind of it's always odd when a different publisher gets a hold of of a something that a artist or an author is mostly known for releasing through a different publication. All right, and then finally the last but not least here is uh volumes 4 through 17 of a uh, Doro Hedoro, which is a which is a manga series about a weird kind of post-apocalyptic world where uh, witches and sorcerers have basically taken over and they have the and they're just all these weird mangled looking kind of people that that just they they mostly go to this one area called the hole which is where pe some people live and they mostly go there just to practice their magic on 
And of course, in this and in this universe, magic, as done by sorcerers, comes out as this weird black smoke, and then the black smoke does the magic. And of course, some some sorcerers are really good at it. Some are very poor at it. And uh, one individual is a guy who who was uh, enchanted by a sorcerer to have to have this uh, lizard head. And it also made him invulnerable to all kind of sorcery magic. And it also took away his memories. And he's trying to figure out, you know, who did it to him and how to find him and uh, get his memories and stuff back. But, uh, you know, obviously that's just the initial pitch. As you go deeper into the series, you actually get to know a lot about the different sorcerers, especially a lot of the uh, the sort of the sort of villain characters in here who becomes extremely likable and how and how weird and off kilter they are and you also get to learn more about kind of the world they live in it's not just it's not just uh it's not just sorcerers there are also demons who do regular demonic pacts with uh with sorcerers and people and demons are actually on almost a different level than the sorcerers themselves and uh and even just uh, some of the people who then try to become sorcerers, who are actually uh, mostly the most dangerous ones uh, around, is the ones that are sort that are humans that try to become sorcerers through various means, because you can actually get the black smoke powder that emanates from sorcerers, and you can actually store that in like a a sack or something, and you can actually artificially create magic. If you don't have it, it's a it's a very neat kind of it, it's a very neat kind of power based system that they have. Uh, it's it's nothing like on the level of say like uh, Hunter Hunter's Nen abilities where it's where it's intricately fleshed out because there's some weird stuff that goes on in there, specifically things like time magic, which only one person does and it's extremely limited, and then uh, also something like healing magic is also very limited with certain characters who can only do a limited amount of it, and some of it being sort of a workaround kind of healing magic. Um, and just some other weird, bizarre stuff in there. I, I especially also love the art style in here, where it's where it's very dark and grungy, and, and it looks like kind of something you'd see in like a 1990s kind of liquid television uh, MTV kind of style. Uh, definitely check it out. I'd say if you want something that's very that's very sort of punkish, extreme, in sort of this uh, Mad Maxi kind of way, uh, in the, in just the kind of you know disregard for a lot of it, it doesn't follow a traditional kind of plot. It it jumps around a lot in different places, it, but it never it never gets too confusing, uh, and it's still going on. I think it's. It, it, I just got the 21st volume, and I'm still working through it, but uh, I believe it's supposed to be wrapping up soon from some of the things I've heard online, but uh, still really fantastic stuff. In any case, that's all I've got for, uh, for trying to catch up with uh, all the manga stuff I've done here, so uh, I'll definitely try and, uh, you know, now that I've got my affairs in order here, for the time being, uh, I hope to, you know, get some more content and some more different kind of content out there for y'all to enjoy. And uh, otherwise, uh, you know, see y'all later. Bye.